Well, friends, greetings from uh, sisters and brothers in Oxford, especially from New Road Baptist Church in the centre of the city. It is uh, really a delight to be with you all. Let's pray first. May the word from the past come alive in the present. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, here are some words from our reading from the letter to the Romans. The spirit we have received makes us children of God, enabling us to cry, Abba, Father. You'll know that in the church calendar today is celebrated as Trinity Sunday. And this poses a real challenge to any preacher. What can one say in a few minutes about that ancient and difficult formula that God is one divine essence and three persons? It took the church 300 years to develop that form of words, and it's taken 1,700 more to try and understand it. Many people are, frankly, baffled by what seems the ultimate piece of Christian jargon. What then can a preacher say in a few minutes? Preachers try, of course. Let me briefly tell you about two sermons I've heard on this day in the past. In the first, the preacher invited the children who were present to put up their hands if they had three names and then asked them to tell him what they were. For example, Fiona, Susan, Smith. God, he then informed them, is also a person who has three names, Father, Son, and Spirit. The second sermon invited the congregation to think of the persons of the Trinity as different members of a football team. He said, uh, there's the manager, the father, the player, the son, and the coach, the spirit, but they're all one team. Now I wonder if you can spot the problems with these two illustrations of the Trinity. The first, a God with three names, certainly stresses the nature of God as one, but does seem to take seriously, fail to take seriously, the, the three persons. The second, uh, a kind of divine team, certainly stresses the three persons, but at the expense of one God. And these hapless preachers failed to notice that they were urging ideas that the early church had long ago dismissed as being heresies. But perhaps these examples have only served to confirm your belief that the doctrine of the Trinity is a highly complicated piece of jargon, little to do with everyday experience, best avoided by sensible preachers and by congregations too. You might have some sympathy with one churchgoer who took part in a recent sociological survey who was asked what he thought about the Trinity, and he replied, well, if God was two persons, he'd be less than what he is. And if four persons, more than necessary. But if God decides to make another person, that's all right with me. Uh, that person, by the way, who made that comment was a Baptist. To God, as a mathematical puzzle into which three or even four will go, as long as it's God's way of doing numbers. But what I want to say this morning is that far from being jargon remote from life, far from being a mathematical puzzle, however holy, this doctrine actually arose from experience. First, it's an experience of relationship. This technical language of the Trinity one being, three persons, comes from the philosophy of the fourth century. But the church developed these concepts in order to understand an experience, which began with an encounter with God in and through Jesus during his earthly life. It 
was an exper experience that was continued in their meeting with the risen Christ in worship and with the coming of the energy of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. If the ideas seem complicated, this was because thoughtful Christian believers found their experience of God to be quite complex. They found that the richness and depth of this meeting couldn't be satisfied by simply saying the word God alone. These early Christians found that they had to say that they encountered the one and only Lord as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God's unveiling of God's own self was bursting the boundaries of everyday speech. People were being called to voyage into strange regions of thought for which they only developed the theological terms later on. And so in quite early days of the church, we find the Apostle Paul writing, as in our text, the spirit we have received makes us children of God, enabling us to cry, Abba, Father. When he thought about his experience of God, he could only say that it was like the Holy Spirit calling him to call God Father because Christ had made it possible for him to become a son like himself. A phrase from the letter to the Ephesians also sums up the pattern of prayer as speaking to the Father, through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. To say that the one Lord whom they met was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was a symbolic way of speaking about a God who is rich in loving relationships within God's self and who wants to relate to us in a generous way. Indeed, after grappling with the mysteries of the being of God, St. Augustine could only sigh and confess that to avoid remaining silent, we say that the names Father and Son refer to the relationship. God as the supreme reality is relational, and that's what we'd expect from the creator of a universe that we heard about in our first Old Testament reading. A universe we now know to be a network of relationships, a web holding together life at every level. And so second, this doctrine is sharing in the life of God. God lives in fellowship within God's self and is opening up that communion to draw us in, to include us within the festivity of divine life. The triune God is making room for us to dwell. We have to say that all talk about God must fail. All images fall short. God isn't like other things in the world that can be examined or painted on canvas or etched in glass or sculpted in stone. Talk of God as three relationships makes little sense as a way of trying to visualize God, but it's deeply meaningful as a way of talking about our sharing in the life of God. Speaking of God as Trinity isn't the language of a spectator, but a participant. We're not saying, so that's what God looks like. We're saying, this is what it's like to get involved in a network of relationships. One person in Christian history who tells us what this is like is St. John of the Cross. He writes in his poems about an experience that he calls the dark night, when he felt alone, forsaken, without human support. And we might feel some familiarity with his state of mind at the moment, as we're separated in lockdown from our usual meetings with others, or 
isolated from our parents or children or grandchildren. We may have known the darkest night of loss of loved ones. What St. John tells us is that it felt for him like wading into deep water in the depths of night. And yet at that very moment, feeling a flow surrounding him like three different currents of water interweaving with each other. He felt not overwhelmed, but embraced, refreshed by living water. And so he writes, the spring that brims and ripples, oh, I know, in dark of night. Waters that flow forever and a day through a lost country, oh, I know the way in dark of night. Bounty of waters flooding from this well invigorates all earth, high heaven and hell in dark of night. To Two merging currents of the living spring. From these a third, no less astonishing, in dark of night. The poet felt not overwhelmed by these currents, but embraced, held, refreshed, as if by living water. So it's best to avoid pictures that attempt to illustrate God, like the ones I began with from our two creatures. We should think instead about actual situations in which we participate in God, in which we experience, like St. John, the flowing around us of supportive love. And if we do this, we discover a movement which we can say is like the movement of a son towards a father. In the words of our text, when we pray to God as Father, we're leaning on a movement of speech that's already there ahead of us, crying, Father. We're sharing in a conversation that we can only say is like that between a son and a father. Our weak word, Father, is surrounded and supported by the strong word of the Son. Our feeble yes is held within his yes. The yes that Christ said in the wilderness, in the garden of Gethsemane and on the cross. The yes that Christ goes on saying in eternity. It's in that human and divine yes that we are praying. That's what it means to pray through the Son to the Father. Paul affirms that all the promises of God find their yes in Christ. That's why we utter the Amen through him to the glory of God. In our prayers in this service, we've had an opportunity to say yes to the goodness of God as we come with our problems, troubles, sorrows, grievances, perplexities. We can't say that yes unless we're leaning on a yes movement that's already there in the response which is like that of a son to the father. Prayer is to the father through the son. And so we find a movement of relation which is also like that from a father to a son. It is sharing in the mission of God. The Trinitarian doctrine says that the Father eternally begets the Son. That is, he eternally sends out the Son, a journey which will lead him finally into the far country, into our world, to reconcile us, to call us into his own communion. And we're invited to share in that movement too that's already going on. Jesus reminds us of this at the end of the fourth gospel, as he breathes out the Spirit on his followers and says, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And in our gospel reading from Matthew, we heard, It is your job to go 
to all people. And so we shall find ourselves within a flow of being sent. Sent to share someone's loneliness. Sent to give time and effort to help another, though we're hard pressed. Sent to listen to someone whom everyone is ignoring. Sent to say the first word of apology, which will break the deadlock. Sent to offer the word of forgiveness that will heal wounds. Sent to speak a word of truth to power. At this moment in the UK, our physical travel is limited, even if lockdown is being gradually lifted. But we can share in this movement of being sent through using social networks, through the telephone, through letters. We can take the first move of approach to another, even at a social distance of two meters. And as we share in these movements of the father and the son, we find they're being opened up to new depths of love, to a new future of hope by a third movement. They're broken open by a surge of energy that's light the wind blowing, or breath stirring, or fire burning, or wings beating and lifting us up in the air. And we can only say, with St. Paul in our reading, this is in the spirit. These three movements in God are all to do with giving and receiving in relationship. And so they can't be confined to one gender. I've so far been using the language that Christ taught us, Father, Son, and Spirit. But this isn't enough. It's never enough. These patterns of life and love can be gendered differently, and they must be if they reflect actual experience. Experience compels us to say, that at times we feel that these relations are also like those between a mother and a daughter, or a son and a mother, or a daughter and a father. And with the Lady Julian, we're compelled to say, God, our mother. Early theologians thought of these three patterns of love in God as interweaving and intertwining with each other, entering into each other, moving in and out of each other, living in and through each other, responding to each other. And with some more recent Christian thinkers, we can say this interactive movement is like a dance. This is what Trinity is about, an eternal dance of love that draws us in inviting us to join our faltering footsteps with the flow of life which is sweeping on and before and beyond us. We're being called deeper into its movements, always further out and further in. The dance goes on. <laughs>